Welcome to lecture number 10 of our, view to, of our YouTube series. Um, we're getting ready to start a brand new year, 2016. Uh, you'll notice I don't have any uh, opening music anymore. I'm going to kind of skip that for, for these next videos. Um, I know. But uh, from time to time, I'll still try to maybe have some sound effects in there if you like that. Good, good. Well, at least some of you do. I know not all of you do, but uh, I will warn you, as I told you before we went on break, uh, the classroom's going to become more flipped than ever before, so these will be actual lectures. So they might go a little bit longer than they, they normally... If you keep doing that, it'll go even longer. So we won't do that anymore, right? Good. All right, so... Yeah, so there'll be more of these lectures here so that in class we're going to look at some very specific things that will deal with the key concepts. And your overall knowledge and content will have to come from the video logs here. Uh, I'm not going to require you to fill out a video log uh, for a grade, uh, but I will ask that you take notes. And I will look at those notes from time to time for some points in class. So just be no aware of that. And uh, like I said, I, I will remind you in class as well of this. So we're looking at progressivism now. We're starting key concept number seven. Uh, key concept number seven is a long uh, a period of time. Uh, it's going to cover a lot of different things, but we're going to start with the beginning of the 20th century and this new thing called progressivism, this progressive era that starts to emerge. Now, as you see here in the concept, remember, You'll notice the one, the two, and the three, that's not there. I put that there. And by now, hopefully you know why that's there, right? That could be a multiple choice question. So just remember that. So a question about uh, the early 20th century progressives responded to which of the following? Well, they responded to political corruption. They responded to economic instability and also various social concerns. Now, if you remember, again, just before the break, so that's two weeks of non-reading and studying, so I know we probably forgot everything. We had, were in what was called the Gilded Age, and the Gilded Age was a time of great corruption, a time period where politicians stopped caring about the people, only cared about themselves, the rise of political bosses. Uh, there was... You know, and again, there are a lot of social ills that were happening in America, primarily with immigration and also with segregation with freed uh, African Americans after the Civil War. So the progressives finally come around and decide it's time to change this. All right, another question I can ask you is how did they do this? Well, they did by calling for greater government action and other political and social measures. What makes the progressive reform movement different than any other reform movement in American history. It was both a social reform and a political reform. And something you're going to have to really take note of is that this is predominantly a middle class. It does say middle and upper in our, in our concepts there, but it's actually more of a middle class movement than anything else. Even your textbook focuses on the fact that it's a middle class movement. Uh, mostly, again, women involved, but a lot of men, and as we will come to see, some very famous politicians, uh, presidents. We're going to have three specific presidents of the progressive era, starting with Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. But let's look at this right here, the progressive era journalism, journalist. All of a sudden, this is kind of where it really begins, where men and women start to really take notice of some of the things that are happening in the world, and especially in America, and they begin to write about it. They begin to expose a lot of the problems that are going on. Now, a person who's often considered the father of this movement, Jacob Reese. Jacob Reese himself was an immigrant. He is going to be part of a movement known as the Muckrakers. The Muckrakers is a name given to these journalists by none other than Theodore Roosevelt. Now we're going to look at Roosevelt's speech called The Man with the Muckrake. We're going to look at that speech in class 
and see why it is he didn't necessarily agree with these journalists, but he understood why they were doing what they were doing. He called them muckrakers, uh, men who all they want to do is take a rake to the bottom of a pond and muck up all the nasty dirt up, and that's all they ever focused on. They never focused on the good things of society. Well, they're investigating journalists. Investigative journalists look at the bad things of life and try to expose them. Now, Jacob Rees, he, he isn't a writer. He actually, his famous book, How the Other Half Lived, is actually a photo book. He began to realize immigrants are horribly mistreated. He himself is an immigrant. He lives in New York. Uh, he was friends with Theodore Roosevelt when Theodore Roosevelt was the uh, police commissioner of New York City. And he began to show Roosevelt some of the living conditions. If you remember again, pre the break, that's two weeks ago, so that's a long time ago, um, they were living in those tenement homes. Uh, and I told you how they would put two, three, four, five families together, uh, no windows, they'd have those air drafts, those dumbbell tenement housing that they put them in, very dangerous uh, places to live, uh, squalor, slums, uh, we would think of words like that. We, we think of places where these in immigrants were forced to live. But he realized just writing about it, people kind of, ah, okay. Uh, it's not like, you know, reading is fine and everything. But he got the idea, let's take some pictures. Now, here's something that's fun. History is full of one person does something over here and three other people on the other side of the world who had nothing to do with that will benefit from it. And one of it is, how was Jacob Riss able to take pictures? Well, flexible photography is now going to be invented, uh, which is nice. Uh, it allows people to have their own cameras. No longer are people setting up these daguerreotype uh, contraptions where everyone has to stand still and you're really just burning what's called a tintype. Now you're going to get actual photographs. But how do you do it at night? Well, there's a book I really like called How We Got to Now, written by a very, very popular author of our time period, Stephen Johnson. If you ever get a chance to read any of Stephen Johnson stuff, I highly recommend it, especially The Invention of Air, one of my favorite books of all time. But this is How We Got to Now. He saw about two German scientists who were working on a usable flash so that you could take pictures at night. And they combined this magnesium powder with potassium chloride, creating a more stable concoction that allowed shutter speed for photographs in low light conditions. They call it Blitzlicht, which is German for flashlight. Now, most of the world took no note of this. It was just an interesting thing happening in Germany. But in October of 1887, the New York paper ran just a four-line commentary on this Blitzlicht bleach light or flashlight that these Germans were inventing. Most people didn't take any notice. Just four lines in the newspaper. Just four lines in the newspaper. But Jacob Reese was sitting having breakfast with his wife in Brooklyn and he read this and he got himself an idea. Take this flashlight that these Germans are inventing and it's, it's an exploding light right, that you make so you can take pictures at night. And he goes down at night to the tenement homes, now with this flashlight, or blitz light, as the Germans called it, to take photographs. Also, it was more convenient to do it at night, because that's when all, everyone's home anyways. And he put together one of the most powerful books in our history, How the Other Half Lived. I'll show you some of the pictures later on in class. This is what got conversations going. 1890 is when this book is published. It became a bestseller in America. It got Theodore Roosevelt interested in helping individuals. And then it led to other investigative journalists who started to come along as well. And like I told you, collectively, they are known as the muckrakers. But it's more than likely starting here is where we get the beginning of progressivism. Two others that I put on here, Ida Tarbell, uh, our first real strong female investigative reporter. She took on Standard Oil. And you might think, oh, well, big deal. Well, that's John D. Rockefeller, people. Yeah, that Rockefeller. And she took him on. Uh, and by investigating the corruption that was going on in his company, it eventually led to the government getting involved. And eventually, 
Not immediately, but eventually, Standard Oil will be divided into two companies. In the United States, it will be known as Mobil, and in Europe, it would be called Esso or Exxon. You might recognize those two gas companies. We have them to this day. David Phillips was another very powerful reporter, a very famous series of articles for magazines he wrote called The Treason of the Senate. And I have a quote here that you might want to familiarize yourself with. I'm not going to read it, but if I'm asking you to familiarize yourself with it, it's more than likely you're going to see this again. But again, attacking the Senate. At this time period, U.S. Senators are not elected by the people. They're appointed by the state governments. Think about this again. We talked about the Gilded Age, the political bosses. First they controlled the local cities, then they started to control the state legislation, then once they controlled the state legislation and the entire state, they got to decide who would be a U.S. Senator. So Senators stopped caring about the people as much as they did who put them in power, the political bosses, or the big monopolies that also went into cahoots with the political bosses. Here's a political cartoon of the time period. I love this cartoon. It's called The Bosses of the Senate. All right, here's the Senate, and here come their bosses. Here's the door that says, Entrance for Monopolis. They're giant bags of money, right? Steel Beam Trust, Copper Trust, Standard Oil Trust, right? There's a Nail Trust, Sugar Trust, Coal, right? All these powerful, powerful monopolists. The People's Entrance it says closed. You can't read it, but that's what it says, closed. Then up here it says, this is a Senate of the monopolist, by the monopolist, for the monopolist. So obviously people like David Phillips and the, the author of this cartoon are trying to tell you it's change needs to happen and it needs to happen at every level of government. From the national to the state to the local, if we're really going to finally start helping people and this is the beginning of the progressive era. So progressivism, and again, here's our key concept over to the side where it's introduced, our historical thinking skills as well. We can do comparison, right? We can also do, what do you think PCC is? You know, patterns of continuity and change, right? Things that are staying the same, things that are changing. So we're going from a gilded age into a progressive era. So how do we compare these two eras? You know, what makes them different? What are some things that stayed the same? What are some things that changed? Well, these progressives now start to emerge by 1901, 1902. Uh, first, it's a social movement, but it becomes a very political one because of Theodore Roosevelt. They have two major goals. They want to curve the power of the trust. They want the state to be able to do this. That's the monopoly. <clears throat> and they want to stop the threat of socialism, which I always find interesting because a lot of people that hate progressivism will tell you progressives were socialists. And they weren't. They're liberals. Here's the beginning of liberalism in America. And eventually, progressivism will overtake the Democratic Party. Our current president, Barack Obama, is an heir to the progressive throne. There's a lot of things he does that are very what we would call progressive. Obamacare, for instance. Um, all of this was really meant to improve life. They also begin to realize America has changed. They could no longer live in the shadow of the founders of America. Uh, this comes from another book that I like a lot called The Jefferson Rule. Um, I like that statement. You know, America has changed since George Washington. America has changed since Thomas Jefferson. How can we keep living in a government that's exactly the same? It's got to change as well. It's got to understand that technology has changed. The economic wealth of the country has changed. America is slowly getting involved in the world. So there are things that are different that you cannot live like Washington, Jefferson, and Adams did, you know, a hundred some odd years earlier. In the beginning, both Republicans and Democrats both had progressive elements, but eventually it'll be the Democratic Party that will marry itself to progressivism. Uh, another couple of things they give us here, primary elections. This is something that's going to start here in 2016. The primary elections are upon us. Both the Democrats and the Republicans are running their candidates. The people in the various states get to go and decide. This is something the progressives called for. Again, previous to that, the parties themselves decided who would run for president. You, the people, had no choice in that. 
progressives want you to have that choice. So we get primary elections. They realize, again, anything you can do to undermine the power of political bosses was a good thing. Referendums and recalls. A referendum. Someone wants to raise taxes to build, I'm going to make it a, 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 a current thing. Someone wants to build a football stadium in your backyard. And they want the state's going to pay for that out of your taxpayer dollars. Well, a referendum allows you to vote if you even want to do that or not. Not just decide and let the political bosses decide to do that. Remember George Washington Plunkett? I seized my opportunities and I took them. See, with the referendum, you can't have that anymore. Now the people get a say. A recall vote is exactly what that sounds like. You, something gets voted on and the people feel like this wasn't a good thing. You get enough petitioners to sign a petition and you can recall a vote and vote over again. Progressivism does have some of its drawbacks, and here it is in our, our concept as well when it comes to segregation. Obviously, segregation is going to be a touchy subject. Uh, some will ignore segregation. Some will actually support it. Some progressives called the expression the shield of segregation. They felt that it was actually a protection for African Americans. Um, so in the beginning, you cannot argue really that these progressive liberals were about civil rights per se. Now, some of them do get involved in civil rights movements. Uh, and eventually, African Americans, this is why African Americans eventually will join the Democratic Party, because eventually the Democrats will become more liberal and hoping that liberalism will lead more to civil rights. The Republicans will come out of this time period much more conservative. So this will create a change, all right? Continuity and changes will change, will eventually create a change in voting patterns for African Americans. In the at the end of the 19th century, throughout the beginning of the 20th century, they're gonna vote Republican, Abraham Lincoln's party, all right? But they would progressivism, liberal reform, they start equating that with civil rights. By the 1920s, 1930s, they start voting more and more Democrat. They fostered things like efficiency. They, home economics isn't like what you might have taught in school. What they wanted to do is create a very efficient home for the wife so that she can get chores done quicker and then allow her to have free time. She can perhaps take night school and get a college education, or she could get a job, a part-time job if she wanted, or she could pursue some other pursuit that she herself would want to do by making her home more efficient. They promoted social welfare. One of the things we get that's still with us is the YMCA. And of course, Jane Addams is mentioned in period six, but she should also be here in period seven. Hull House, those settlement homes, also a very, very big part of progressivism. Well, now let's look at the presidency, because that's what this thing is really titled. Our three presidents, Roosevelt, Taft, and then Woodrow Wilson. And, um, yeah, it's a it's a interesting thing with Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, sort of an accidental president, right? He was the vice president of William McKinley, who got elected in 1900. And in the summer of 1901, while visiting the, the World's Fair at Buffalo, New York, William McKinley will be assassinated by an anarchist, uh, uh, Leon Chalgos. And Theodore Roosevelt becomes president, a man that the Republicans never, ever wanted to be president, ever. And I'll talk some more about this in class. Obviously, one of my favorite presidents, because he's pretty crazy. There's no doubt about it that, uh, yeah, he, there's a little something there with Theodore. But he, in a lot of respects, he was the right guy at the time. He gave a speech. We come to call it the square deal. Using the word square in this uh connotation. It's kind of an old-timey expression. Uh, it means something that's fair or something that's equal. All right, so all Americans deserve an equal share or a fair share of living in America, so we call it the square deal. And it comes down to what he called the three C's, all right? Taking care of the corporations, giving consumer protection, and preserving our, cons our conservation of wildlife and our natural resources. One of the things that showed that Theodore Roosevelt was going to be a different president, 
was the 1902 coal mine strike. Taking a little sip of tea, a lot of talking here, got to keep my, keep my voice going. Uh, the coal mine strike. Uh, these uh, coal miners in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, they go on strike. Horrible working conditions, low, low pay. And they go on strike just a few months before winter is about to come. Now, up until now, every president had sided with management. I think of those famous strikes at the time period, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Rutherford B. Hayes sends in the troops and they fire upon Americans, right? We get the Pullman strike of 1893, I believe it is, and Grover Cleveland says, if I have to, the entire army and navy to deliver one postcard, so he sends in the troops. Presidents always sided with management until Theodore Roosevelt. He got very angry. He called for management to come meet him at the White House so he can discuss this issue, and they refused to do it. They felt the president works for them, they didn't understand Theodore. You don't tell Theodore Roosevelt that. No, 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 no. Not a good thing. He threatens to federalize the coal mines, meaning that all coal mines would now come under the authority of the federal government, and then they would lose their property. That got them all to the table, and Roosevelt begins to negotiate on, part, on the behalf of labor. He took the side of labor in this. Now, they didn't get everything they wanted, but they did get enough out of this, and it showed now that the president was now going to take a more active role in social affairs and that the president would now be a person who would look at the, what was good for the American people. This was something that hadn't happened in quite a while. He also adds a new position to his cabinet, Department of Commerce and Labor. He is called the trust-busting president, and that's really not what he does. This infers the fact that he took monopolies and he broke them up, and that's not what he ever really did. He believed in regulation or controlling of the trust, the good trust versus a bad trust. And that's what his political cartoon tells us. Roosevelt f believed fully that the monopoly was here to stay. You can't move back the hands of time. You cannot go back to the ancient world. We are now a modern, industrialized nation. Monopolies are here. However, we can control them so that they stay good. If they become bad, and 44 of them he will regulate, starting with J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Company, his railroad company. And we get two big railroad acts passed at the time. The ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, was this federal agency that was supposed to regulate, for instance, the railroads, but never had any power. Now Roosevelt gets two major acts passed. The Elkins Act, you can now regulate rebates. They were using, and you know what a rebate is, right? They were using this as bribes, right? As a bribe to get what they wanted. Well, you can't do that anymore. In the Hepburn Act, now the ICC can regulate the rates that they charge. Railroads were charging whatever rates they wanted uh, and thereby really hurting the consumer. Can't do that anymore. And no more free passes for people you claim are loyal shippers. Everyone must pay the same. So Roosevelt began to show that he was a man who was going to try to help the people when it came to the corporations. He's also going to help us when it came to the consumer. Upton Sinclair has written a book called The Jungle. Nasty book. A nasty book. It's a, uh, it's a book that basically outlines just how gross it is to work in the um, meatpacking industry. Here's what I've told you before. You know, people were losing their arms in machines, and people were still, you know... You know, eating hamburgers, Ugh, just, uh, yeah, just uh, really gross. I'm just thinking about that. I'm just, I am not, uh, I'm not liking the thought of that. He becomes outraged, right, as well as the people are outraged after reading this book. And he gets the Meat Inspection Act passed, where the government will now go out and inspect meatpacking uh, factories and uh, make sure that uh, everything is on the up and up. Uh, he also gets uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act passed, right? Here, this prevents what's called the adulteration of uh, various products. Like Coca-Cola. Like Coca-Cola would declare that uh, it could cure everything from baldness uh, 
uh, to psoriasis, you know, almost anything. Pepsi would, do, by the way, think of the word Pepsi Cola. You might recognize a word that's very similar to another product called uh, Pepto Bismol. It's got peptic acid in it. Dr. Pepper, by the way, was a real doctor. All right. A lot of these soda companies decided that they would produce their soda and make other claims, as well as did other products. Well, adulteration means you can't just put things in, in there that you think will help people do stuff without any proof to it. You can't adulterate your product. You got to really give us what it's supposed to be. Soda should be car caramelized water, or whatever that is, right? You can't mislabel your product anymore. You can't just sell it and say whatever it is you want to say it can do. All right, so very important. You know, Theodore Roosevelt has a huge legacy for us today. Every time you drink some clean water, every time you put a steak on the grill and you don't feel like you're going to be eating somebody's, you know, left toe, uh, you know, thank you, Theodore Roosevelt, for that. We should all be applauding him, right? In fact, uh, Oh, see, I'm trying to do this quick. Ah, oh, there it is. Yes. Thank you, Theodore. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What about conservation? All right. He wasn't a preservationist. He didn't believe that land should be preserved forever. He believed that it could be conserved. Um, and here it is right there in your key concepts as well. He knew that the national resources were running thin, plus he was totally in love with America. He felt the landscape of America was the cathedral of our country. Going to the Grand Canyon, going to the Redwood Forest, going to Niagara Falls, the Mississippi River. These things were beautiful and they needed to be preserved. We get the New Lands Act that's passed, setting aside uh, land for conservation, uh, but it also allowed the government to sell off land so they can raise money for irrigation as well. Uh, but he did set aside 125 million acres for Federal Reserve. Uh, this created our national park system. When you go to a national park, again, thank you, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, a lot of good things that he did in this regard. Well, let's look at the second president now, William Howard Taft. Uh, we'll talk about this later on in class. Uh, Roosevelt decides not to run for another election, which is going to haunt him for the rest of his life. And he decides that Taft is a lot like him. And I love this cartoon. Here's Roosevelt leaving. And he's leaving a baby that looks just like him called My Policies with the new housemaid, William Howard Taft. And I love the luggage here. You'll get this reference later on. That's Roosevelt's big stick. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, unfortunately, Taft is no Roosevelt. Taft does not have the force of personality. He's a Republican who turns out to be much more of a conservative than a progressive. And he really didn't like politics. He loved law. Uh, he wanted to be a judge. In fact, after he leaves the White House, he'll be our only president ever to date that will be appointed to the Supreme Court, uh, William Howard Taft. In fact, he'll become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court after he leaves the White House. But while he's there, he is not very progressive. And there's certain things that start to happen. He will, for instance, he embraces a higher tariff because the Republicans do. Uh, he did regulate more trust than Roosevelt did. He regulates over 90 compared to Roosevelt's 44. But this big problem comes over conservation. This ballinger pinchot quarrel happens. Roosevelt, uh, Taft starts to allow the Republican Party to take over a lot of the land that Roosevelt set aside specifically for parks and give it over to corporation to develop it. And Ballinger is the uh, Secretary of the Interior, and Pinchot is a head of Parks and Recreation, I guess. He's a low-level low government guy, but he's a Roosevelt guy. And he tries to fight Ballinger and gets fired for it. And Taft upheld the firing of Pinchot, which really, really angers Roosevelt. And we're going to get into this whole fight that Roosevelt and Taft are going to have because of this. Taft is not going to be as liberal as Roosevelt was. He's going to be much more conservative. And it's going to lead to a very bizarre election year in 1912 that we're going to talk about in class. But that leads us to our third and final president, Woodrow Wilson. We get a lot of progressive law. He is a Democrat. He is the one who's going to make the Democratic Party basically a mirror image of progressivism. Uh, he gives his own speeches. You know, Roosevelt had his square deal. 
Well, Wilson has his new freedom, and he talks about the triple wall of privilege, that there are these powerful people in our country, and they enjoy this wall of privilege. The tariffs protect them. The banks protect them. And, of course, they have allied themselves in the big monopolies or trust. So as president, he's going to go after this. And we're going to... He's going to reduce the tariffs. We get the Underwood Tariff Bill, 1913. He's going to completely change the federal banking system. The Federal Reserve Act, which is with us to this day, if you take out a piece of paper out of your wallet, I don't care if it's a 1, a 5, a 10, or a 20, or whatever, it's going to tell you Federal Reserve Note on there. So this is the Federal Reserve Act. The government has now more say and control in banking than ever before. In fact, the president has a right to look at and appoint the board of directors of the Federal Reserve and uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He strengthens the antitrust laws in America, the Clinton Antitrust Act. They had an antitrust law, the Sherman Act, which very weak, very weak. Uh, it was in the 1890s, it was rarely used except to attack labor. When labor went on strike was the only time they would actually use the Sherman Act but now you have this Clayton Antitrust Act, which is with us to this day. To this day, the government can look at anybody's business and decide if they're trying to become a monopoly, if they're trying to do unfair business practices. And the government has the power now to go after them. And in our concept here, it tells you about these amendments that are added to the Constitution. And here they are, the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. And they respectively are income tax electing U.S. Senators, the Prohibition, and Suffrage. More of these we'll talk more about in class specifically. So there you are. There's our little lesson on progressivism. It's going to be very important that you watch this, that you have knowledge of this before we start getting into some of these things in class, and especially, obviously, for our writing. Yes, I did say writing. I'm sorry about that. I know exactly what everybody wants to say when I say writing. Get it out, get it out now, get it out, get it out, get it out of your system so you don't do it in class. <laughs> I, would, I would cry. All right, uh, here is some of the reading that you can do in our book, and we'll see everybody later. Whoops, I just dropped my highlighter. We'll see everybody later in class. Bye-bye.